Hi, Misha here, and a bit of change of pace for me. That I would talk about a knife today. I don't own many knives, but this one was always of interest to me, and I finally picked one up. This is a U.S. Army, U.S. Military, M3 fighting knife. Often called a trench knife often misused as a utility knife. And this was produced quite briefly, honestly, in World War II. But was used throughout Korea and even into Vietnam. And more importantly, it spawned a whole series, a whole family of bayonets from the M4, M5, M6, even into the M7 that's still in use today. Which is pretty remarkable because these pretty much all have the same overall length of 11 and 3 quarter inches with a blade of 6 and 3 quarter inches made of carbon steel. And early on it could be either blued or parkerized. Of course, newer production is pretty much always parkerized. So, thought we would just uh, chat a bit about this neat knife's history and then a little bit about its offspring over here get into it and here she is out of her scabbard notice the leather grip these are kind of individual cylinders put together we have a cross guard that's bent to put your thumb on the edge, you have a full edge on this side. This is a pretty much partial edge, half edge on this side. And we have a spear point. And again, this is a true knife, so no bayonet end. And to help me talk about this, I brought up my World War II 45 and earlier M1 carbine, which you'll notice doesn't have a bayonet lug. That's where this knife comes in. This was designed to replace the traditional Mark I trench knife used in World War I and at the very beginning of World War II. But it was old world tech. It required more steel, more man hours to produce. The army needed something that did not require as many resources and could be produced faster in, in huge quantities. So at the end of 1942, the prototype of this knife was tested out. Mostly its competition was the Marine Corps M2 K-Bar. And they went with this. It was a little cheaper, faster to produce. It was adopted as a true fighting knife. The reason they didn't give a full edge on this side was to give a little more strength because it's a relatively thin blade. This was meant for stabbing, thrusting. It wasn't very good at slashing, and it was rather terrible at being a utility knife. Easily broken. And this was to be issued to people who didn't otherwise have a bayonet, who didn't have a rifle that took one. The M1 carbine kind of comes to mind, because early on, people who got these, no, no bayonet lug. And this is how this knife became associated with the uh, 101... Airborne, the paratroopers. It also was early on given to the Army Rangers and many others. But it was also expected to be given to people who had handguns like this, including officers, and also even those who had gun machine guns like the uh, the Browning 1918A2, the BAR LMG. So this very quickly went into production, and the first ones were turned out in March of 1943. It started to be delivered. And really the first units to get them were the Airborne, the Rangers, other special forces. Often the, the lower ranks had a harder time getting them. And uh, they became pretty iconic as they, you know, easily produced fighting knife. They would simplify the manufacturing of the grip a bit. The blade, the blade could either be blued or phosphated. 
Originally, in 1943, they came with the M6 scabbard, which was leather. But then in 44, the M8 came along, which is fiberglass. M8s don't have the uh, metal tip. M8A1s would. M8s originally also did not have the uh, hanger here on them. But many, like this one, were retrofitted with it. Button closure. Originally, the M6 had a leather tie. This one has the more modern nylon. Pretty uh, metal throat here. Pretty typical. And nine companies would make these in World War II. This is a Utica, which is pretty a pretty common maker. Not the most common, but up there. But production would be pretty uh, pretty brief. I'll explain why in just a minute. But even though they would only make these for about a year and a half, they would turn out nearly 2,600,000. <laughs> so quite a big number. So even after production was over, this remained limited issue and available in inventory throughout World War II. In fact, the last ones made didn't even reach the front lines until 1945. And we continued to see issuance throughout Korea and even into the Vietnam War before they were just kind of sold off as surplus. But it is a pretty iconic American World War II knife. And like many early wars things, it was exactly what they needed at the time. But it would quickly evolve. By the way, there are three general variations to this. The earliest ones had the date, 1943, with the maker's mark on the blade. The second major variant would delete the date, just having the maker's mark on the blade. And then the third variant would have the maker's mark on the uh, cross guard here. Small things, and like I said, they would change how they made the leather grip a bit as well. Well, they looked at that, and this would evolve into this, the M4 bayonet with a secondary use as a fighting knife as well. Now, I brought out my M1 carbine that has the bayonet lug, which started to be added late in 44, but it has the compensator on the end, so unless I want to unscrew it, which I don't, I can't put this on. But basically, they changed the hilt here, giving it two spring-loaded catches to lock on to this lug. And they flare it out the end of the cross guard, giving it a ring for the muzzle. By the way, here is an M8A1 scabbard with the metal reinforced tip. Why not? The uh, M4 was first put into production in June of 1944, and thus in August of 1944, the M3 was taken out of production and made kind of a limited substitute issue. The M4 became the standard, and people that were issued a carbine, which were not just people like paratroopers, but also vehicle drivers, and even those driving small landing craft like LSTs might have one. But this was to be their fighting knife as well. But it could double as a bayonet. Now originally, during World War II, when these were built in 44 and 45, they had leather grips as well. Then production would end. But it would start up again around 1954 to make a few more. And they would start getting these black plastic or Bakelite, whatever you, you know, stylized grips. But everything else is the same. Same blade, really. So just a different hilt and cross guard. For the M1 carbine. Kind of neat, I think. But yeah, still not a good utility knife. Still just for stabbing and slashing to a lesser extent. But speaking of the Korean War, 
So after the success of the M4, the blade design was adapted for the M1 Grand, making the M5 bayonet here. Originally the M1 Grand had a lot of different bayonets for it, many of them very long, even like the M1 when shortened. We have a small button here and a muzzle ring. But as soldiers tried to use these in Korea, they complained that they were hard to use with gloves and in less than wonderful environments. So they adapted this again. They gave the latch in the rear the same lug as the M1 Grand. And they gave it a large latch down here. And quite interestingly, this doesn't have a muzzle ring. Instead, it has this little stud that goes into the Grand's gas port. Gas plug, I should say, hole. With this easy to use latch, as you just saw me. There. Now, the M5 came about in 1953 and would be the last bayonet made for the M1 Grand in America at least and there would be an M5A1 with an improved latch that was a little larger and hung down even further of course it's a short blade and again maybe not quite as comfortably because of the stud in theory, it could be used as a fighting knife, although because of this grip, it's probably less practical. And so, it now is on both the M1 Grand and M1 Carbine in varying forms. But, it's far from over. When America, really Springfield, and the Army were designing the M14. They designed a bayonet to go along with it. And really this is the first time from the outset the bayonet and the gun are designed together before the M3's pattern was kind of retrofit and worked around. But these were designed as a unit. The M6 bayonet and it was introduced at the same time as the M14 in 1957. And it's kind of a hybrid of the M4 and M5. I can get it off one-handed here. I can. Fits onto the standard lug here. We have the push button of the M5. We have the bayonet ring the muzzle ring from the M4. And by this point we're solidly solidly, excuse me, into synthetic grip territory. But we still have the six three quarters inch blade, carbon steel, with the half edge on one side and full edge on the other. And we're still using the M8 and M8 A1 scabbard. Because if it ain't broke, I don't fix it. Interestingly, the M6 here was the only bayonet issued with the M14 in America. And the uh, the final contract, the final deliveries of these were in 1969. So right about the time the M14 was being pulled from service. But they've been used for parade and ceremonial duties ever since. And that brings us to our final one. Revolutionary new rifle concept made of all new materials for the 1960s, firing a brand new projectile, yet still using a bayonet derived from the M3. Our final one here is the M7, made for the M16 and M4. This bayonet was introduced in 1964 right as the earliest XM-16s and XM-16E1s appeared in Vietnam. 
and it really is still in production to this very day. In some instances, it's been replaced by newer knives like the M, or excuse me, newer bayonets like the M9, but in others, it is still issued. And this is very much a return to the M4, including its uh, locking lug system with two spring-loaded tabs. Small little lug. About the only notable difference between this and the M4 is the larger muzzle ring to allow for the flash hider, which has to be 22 millimeters for rifle grenades and the like. And we're still using the same scabbard and what have you. And this bayonet has been copied by many nations. And over three million have been produced. So more than the original fighting knife. But still very much the same blade and even the grip is essentially the same size. They just keep changing the pieces to make it interface differently with different guns. And this is very much compatible with the M16A4, the M4A1. Um, it would even fit the Mark 18 if the barrel weren't so short. <laughs> and it dates all the way back to 1943. Pretty neat, I think. And there you have it. Normally I don't seek out knives but in this instance it just led to such a interesting family and of course the m7 pattern was uh, copied by many nations and used on many uh, different guns when i was digging out these i found a, a beretta one done in italy for the uh, bm59 kind of interesting yeah original knife here then we add the ring and locking latches. Then we get away from the ring and add this new style latch. Then we add the ring back, keeping the latch. And then we keep our ring, making it bigger, but kind of go back to that original M4 latch. So, pretty neat to my nerdy mind and so I just thought I would share them with you what do you think and I know that there are people that collect all makes and models and variants of bayonets and I think that's probably pretty awesome but for me since a lot of the variation has to do with new and different makers marks and positioning of marks and since I can't really see those for me I just like having a good honest example piece of uh, of each one but, that said, let's uh, chat about knives and bayonets in the comments. If you have any questions, please post them. And if you could, like, share, subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Misha, and we'll catch you very soon next time.